I'm coming up on two years living in Central Oregon. I didn't realize there were so many Chiefs fans in Central Oregon. <laughs> wow. Shocker. There we go. Excellent. All right. Jesus still loves you. He does. That's the truth. That's the gospel. <laughs> stupid. That's so stupid. You see how I just alienated half of the audience before I opened up the Bible? Dumb. Rookie mistake. Excellent. Hey, if you're here for the first time, my name's Brad, one of the pastors. Uh, we are going through the book of Hebrews right now. So if you would open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, maybe uh, you're new. Somebody just gave you a Bible. You're like, where is Hebrews at? It's going to be clear to the right, or you can just look at the front of your Bible in an index. Uh, it'll tell you what page to go to, as well as the text should be on the screen in just a minute, okay? While you're turning there, a couple of announcements, okay? Uh, giving statements are available downstairs, and so uh, if you gave last year to TFAB, uh, you can go pick up your giving statements down there. The second thing is, listen, we are locked and loaded for 2024, we have a lot of activities that are coming down the pike. I want you to make sure that you're going to our website, checking out tfab.com. Uh, we are going to be having a lot of, uh, uh, of really intentional environments uh, that are created for you to connect and to birth deep relationships with one another. So movies coming up, uh, snowshoeing events, uh, y- you name it. Um, you know, so check that out. You'll want to be a part of that. Okay? All right. Let's jump in. Let me give you some news this morning that you already know. You can be assured in life, storms will come, right? That's just a fact of life. Storms living in a cursed world, in a broken world, storms will come. Uh, They're going to change your circumstances in life. They will change your surroundings in life. They will affect you emotionally. They will affect you mentally. And storms, you know this, they come so fast. Like all it takes is a phone call or a text message or a knock on the door or a visit to a doctor and suddenly you find yourself in the middle of a storm, right? And so here's the million dollar question. When the storm hits in your life, and it will, I'm just loving you by telling you the truth. When the storm hits in your life, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on to? Do you have an anchor to hold on to in the midst of life's storms. And so here's the good news. The author of Hebrews, as we're journeying through this book, he wants to give you an anchor today, okay? Now, warning. The anchor that we're gonna see today, it's gonna, little, it's gonna look a little different than what you are used to. Um, in fact, I would say the anchor we're gonna look at is not necessarily even part of our culture. I would say, in some ways, you and I have never experienced this kind of anchor before. And the reason that we've never experienced it before is this. It's because we're going to be discussing a topic that in some ways we no longer practice within the church, okay? And it's unfamiliar, and because it's unfamiliar, it's hard to recognize. Add to the fact that this anchor is full of symbolism, and you and I know this, that sometimes when we look at the Bible and we see symbolism, it gets really confusing, we're like, what's that? What does that mean? And, and, and then how do I even apply that to my life, okay? So the topic we're going to be discussing today, here it is, it's the topic of a high priest. A high priest. Who's a high priest? What was his position? What was his role? What was his qualifications, okay? What were some of the outcomes of his work? And here's the million-dollar question. How in the world do we see Jesus in the work of the high priest? So, so my job this morning is to do this. It's to give you a little bit of historical context of how life used to be in the Old Testament so we can have a greater appreciation for Jesus, what he's offered us, and what life looks like now. All of this has been rooted in the person and the work of Jesus. So here's what I want to do. We're going to stand. Would you stand with me? We're going to read the text. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. We're going to go through chapter 5, verse 10. Pay attention. Be a part of this morning's conversation of faith. After I read the text, I'm going to pray. We're going to have a seat. And then we're going to go into observations. This is a time for you to jump in and, and, and just say, like, I saw this in the text, okay? It could be a word. It could be a phrase. It could be a concept. And, and just like, what is that? Just like, what's popping off the text to you? What do you see? Okay, here we go. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you're my son today, I've begotten you. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Father, this morning, my my heart's just happy, God, this morning. That's just the truth. And uh, I didn't start that way. That alarm clock went off this morning, and I was just remembering I'm under the curse. (laughs) But by your grace, you've brought us together as family. By your grace, you've given us your word, God, to reveal your heart to us, to teach us something. God, could we just just camp out there for a minute and just be wowed by your incredible grace that you are active and that you are speaking to us. And now my prayer, God, is speak to us in such a way, God, that we would understand it. Like some of this stuff is so foreign. And so, God, would you illuminate your word? I pray this morning, God, I plead on your great grace, God, that that our hearts would be the good soil, that the seed of your word and the preaching of your word would go into our hearts and it would take root and it would bear fruit. Be with us, God. God, I plead, I beg for mercy upon my mind and my heart and my mouth now, God. Would you be seen and would you be heard and would you be glorified? Teach us and lead us this morning. You teach us and lead us by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. All right. There was a lot there in the text. What are some things that you saw in the text? Once again, it could be a word. It could be a topic. It could be a concept. What was just grabbing your attention as we went through the text? Yell it out. What do you got? Jesus, Jesus, safest answer in church. Nailed it. Let's take up an offering. Worship. Go home. Uh, what, what else do you see? He can sympathize with our weakness. Jesus can do what? He can sympathize with our weakness. Great observation. Big, huge. We're going to talk about that this morning. What else did you see? He understands it. He understands it. He gets it. I love it. And then over here, somebody? Is that you, Gabe? He was tempted. Nope. With, uh, we, 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 did, we did not sin. Jesus was tempted, experienced temptation but didn't sin. Great observation. Going to talk about that this morning. What's that look like? What else do you see? Jesus is a high priest from heaven. Okay, what is that? Okay, and then over here, did, what did, something about a good shepherd? He will get obedience through suffering. Oh, yeah, exactly. So that's completely different than what I heard. Okay, so I am deaf from <laughs> rock and roll. All right, Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Great observation. Okay, so here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not going to have a lot of time to unpack that, okay? I want you to study that a little bit more. If you have more com- or questions, uh, listen, I love coffee, okay? So let's just get together over coffee, and we can continue that conversation together. Okay, any more before we jump in? I love how you guys are ready to go. You're locked and loaded this morning. Anything else? We need to listen. Gentleness. We need to learn to listen. We need to learn to listen. Man, so good, so good. Excellent. All right, let's jump in. If you've been around the Bible for any period of time, you've heard about the role and the responsibility of the high priest, okay? Again, who's the high priest? What was his qualifications? What exactly did he do? Why in the world was this so important, okay? Now listen, 
to truly understand and to truly get who Jesus is, we got to answer these questions about the high priest and more, okay? And so to, in order to answer these questions, here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? This morning, we have to take a journey back to the classroom, back to the classroom. In the seventh and eighth grade, I hated science. My science class, it started every quarter with our science teacher just getting up there, and he would just lecture, okay? He would lecture us on, it was just information. It just seemed so incredibly boring. But as the quarter progressed, we would move from the class to the lab, and that's where things got fun. So now it's here, me and my buddies, you know, gathered around Bunsen burners. So now, like, like, we're talking fire. So class is getting exciting pretty quick. And we're boiling things. And we, got to, we had, got to add compounds and components together to see if they would combust. Like, that's fun stuff. Like, we got to feel like balloons full of acetylene. We would tie a string to it. We would go outside. We would light the string. And as the fire went up and melted the balloon, it would release the gas, suddenly causing a huge explosion right? It's awesome. At this point, like suddenly there was a purpose to class and it was fun when we got to the lab, but here it is. It was dangerous. If you didn't pay attention in class, you could really hurt yourself, okay? So this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take that same approach to our time this morning, okay? We need to step back into class. We need to go back and learn some history. We need to learn about some symbolism. In truth, we need to relearn the heart of God, see what he's up to. And then this morning, we're also going to go to the lab. We're going to see how this applies to our lives. But warning, okay, (laughs) if you don't pay attention in the class time, okay, there's a potential for you to get hurt, okay? Come to the wrong conclusions about who God is, Uh, 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 what he's doing, who Jesus is, what he has done, what he's provided for us, what his role in all of this, and why he's doing all this, okay? So if you don't pay close attention in class time, this history portion, you're going to miss it in the lab. So let's go to class time so we don't miss it in the lab, okay? What's some information that the author of Hebrews wants us to know? in order that we would come to some biblical conclusions about who Jesus is. According to the text, we see this. Somehow it centers around this subject of a high priest. Who is the high priest? What was his role? Okay, so let's start, and and, and I'm just going to walk us through this systematically this morning, some information that we need to have so then we can go to the lab, okay? What was the job description of the high priest? What's a high priest do? Like high priest, his role was extremely important. Big picture, okay? The high priest, his function was to be an intercessor between mankind and God. In essence, the high priest was to function as a representative of God's people to God, okay? So think of the role of as a representative. A representative is somebody who's called to be a summary of, of the whole, okay? So, so this represented message should reflect the agreed message of the whole of people, okay? Their attitude should reflect the, the, the um, agreed attitude of the whole of people and, and, and their actions, the agreed actions of the people, okay? Time out, put the pieces together. Again, who is this representative representing? God's children. And what is the spiritual state spiritual condition of God's children. They're imperfect. They're disobedient. And due to sin, they are distant from God. Okay? Now, although it's this, this, is, this is our fault, right? Did they like that? No. They wanted to be close to God, okay? And that's where the role of the high priest comes into. The role of the high priest comes in to address the distance between mankind and God, to address the core root of it, man's disobedience. So to begin to make mediation to God so there can be reconciliation. You need to hear this this morning. Listen to me very closely. God loves mediation. God loves reconciliation. This morning at some point you might be reminded of sin in your life You might feel God, the Holy Spirit, prick your heart and convince you of that. You might feel guilt and you might feel shame. And listen, if you roll off the rails, you don't get this. You roll off the rails, you will think God (coughs) is so angry with you. And God's putting you in a corner. God will never, God has rejected you. 
And that's not the gospel. God loves mediation. He loves reconciliation. And that's part of the role of the high priest. At a root level, what's going on here? The key issue that has separated mankind from God is sin. Not small, big, massive. Like we're talking life and death. The reality of a very real heaven and a very real hell. Nothing to gloss over. Nothing to take lightly. And so again, God in his great grace and his mercy, in the Old Testament, what he did is he made a path forward to make atonement for sin, to cover that sin, to deal with that sin, and to restore relationship with mankind to God. And by the way, you know this, that path was not a clean path. That was a messy path, okay? It wasn't simply just like praying a prayer. Oh God, forgive me of my sins. God, sit with me in this. God, I repent. No, it was messy. It was dirty. It was bloody, literally bloody. It would require the path of pain and death. It would require the blood of unblemished blemished animals to make atonement for sin, okay? So now it's the picture of the intentional killing and slaughtering of a beautiful animal, it's a picture of collecting that animal's blood, all right? It's a, it, it's a picture of taking that blood and applying that, that blood of that beautiful animal to the mercy seat of God to make atonement. So this high priest was called, listen, by nature, he was called into a role of him getting his hands bloody to make atonement for sin. The process of making atonement, listen, it was lengthy. It was full of symbolism. As I go through this this morning, I, listen, I, I'm only going to just scratch the surface. There was so much to this, okay? It would start in the outer courts of the temple with the sacrifice of an animal. It would ultimately end up in the inner courts in the Holy of Holies, sprinkling the blood upon the Ark of the Covenant, specifically the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. And everything that happened from beginning to end was full of symbolism, okay? Now, let's talk about the qualifications of a high priest. What are some of his qualifications? And we see it right here in the text. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 5, it says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin, he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God just as Aaron was called. Okay, through that text right there, we find three different qualifications. They're this solidarity, sympathy, and selection. This is going to be the qualifications for a high priest. Solidarity. What does solidarity mean? Well, we see that in verse 1. Every high priest chosen among men. Chosen among men. Okay, what's this mean? It means the high priest must be a man and he must be human. This means that no angel could be a high priest. This meant that no supernatural being could be a high priest. This meant that no dead person could be a high priest, okay? This person must be mortal. They must be human. This person that functions to represent humanity to God must be human and act on behalf of them. So what is the text saying in the qualification of a high priest? Listen, it's saying that the ideal high priest is not someone who's living isolated from his community and people, and culture. It's saying that the ideal uh, high priest is someone who's involved in the lives of mankind. He sees, and he feels, and he struggles with the brokenness of life, which leads into the second qualification, and that's sympathy. And we see that in verses 2 and 3. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, He's obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. So let me put it this way. The qualified high priest says this 
or knows this or believes this statement. It takes one to know one. It takes one to know one. I can see the sin in your life because I'm a sinner and I can see the sin in my own life. That's what he's saying. He, 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 he knows his weakness. He knows that he is a sinner. He knows the consequences of sin. He doesn't take sin lightly, but he understands how other people can get there. And so he can have humility and compassion as he interacts with other people at the same time calling them up into holiness. I mean, start putting the pieces together here, okay? The high priest is a man. He's human. He has struggles, right? He's not a perfect man. He, he understands the nuances of life. But he gets tired at times, probably overeats at times, right? Maybe gets grumpy, struggles with pride at times, gets tired. Listen, he, he may lose his temper at times. He's a man that aged. Listen, he is a man with limited intellect. At the same time, he's also a human, a man who's living under the curse. And at times in his own personal life, he experiences the pull and the lure of sin. And at times in his own personal life, he takes the bait and he sins. So the picture that we're seeing here in the text is he's a high priest and he's also a sinner. And because he's, he sins, his sins are also have to be atoned for. At his hands, there must be the, the, the killing of a beautiful animal, getting his hands bloody and making atonement for his own sins before he can even make atonement for the sins of a nation. So put this all together, and what do you see? All this actually gives him the tools, listen, to be a beautiful and effective high priest. The last selection of a high priest, it's pretty obvious, or the last qualification of a high priest is, is obvious. It's selection. They're selected. Verse 4 says, No one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron would, or Aaron was. Here it is. All of Israel's high priest had to come through selection by God. In fact, think about this. At times in Scripture, we see people assume that role of priest. And every single time they do that, things go bad for them, like really bad. Old Testament, do you remember Korah and 250 other people? They thought they were just going to assume the role of, of, of being priests. They offered strange incense to God. Do you remember what happened? Like the ground opened up and swallowed them at the hand of God in judgment. There was a king who assumed the role of priest. What was his name? Well, I was going with Saul, right? Right? Like, Samuel, where are you? I, I can do this. I'll assume that role. He lost his kingdom over it. Uzziah, what did he do? Uzziah took the, the priest's scepter and misused it, and God judged him with leprosy until the day that he died. Like, things went bad for people who, who just assumed that I'm going to do that. So the role of high priest isn't something lobbied for, it's not like somebody's running for an election. It's not something that somebody would take by force. But listen, they are sovereignly chosen. And in being sovereignly chosen, it, it, it evoked this deep sense of humility. Me, God? You want me to do this? But I'm a sinner. Me, God? All right. By the way, so, so what we're seeing, the role of high priest like, it wasn't a career path to, be, to, 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 to follow, right? It was a calling by God. Okay, with every job comes a job description, and with some jobs comes a uniform. So let's talk a little bit about the high priest's uniform, then we'll talk about his job description, okay? The uniform. The attire the high priest wore, so much symbolism. Don't even have the time to go there. I'll allude to a few things. This is your opportunity to grow in the faith. Go back and study the high priest uniform, okay? Just like if you're bored, you just need something to get started. Go to Indiana Jones, right? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Little different, lot off, but it'll get you started. That's a dumb joke. Keep going, Brad, okay? Here we go. 
Attire, I, I aged myself right there. The attire the high priest wore, he would, it, he would start off with this. He would start off with a linen tunic, and over that linen tunic, he would put on a blue robe. Now, at the, at the, at the fringes, at the bottom of his blue robe, there were these ornate pomegranates and bells, and they would alternate, and they went all the way around his robe. We'll talk about the bells in a little bit, because those bells, everything that the, that the high priest did, you would hear those bells. You'd be drawn to the activity of this high priest as he's mediating between mankind and God, okay? <clears throat> there was a multicolored sash that held the robe into place. Next, there was an apron that went on, okay? Oftentimes in Scripture, we see it referred to an, as an ephod. It was made with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and again, it was held together with a golden thread. He had shoulder pieces. He had two shoulder pieces. These were uh, a couple of, of onyx stones that were set on either of his shoulders. There was inscribed the 12 tribes of Israel, six on one shoulder, six on the other shoulder. It was all listed according to the birth age of the 12 tribes. From that, came down a breastplate, okay? <clears throat> um, the breastplate was held by golden chains. In the middle of it was a nine-inch tapestry. There was uh, a four-by-three rows of 12 stones that, again, symbolized the 12 different tribes of Israel, 12 different stones. And then lastly, the priest was crowned with a turban, and in the front was a golden plate, and there was an inscription on that golden plate. Does anybody remember what that inscription said? No. Somebody, somebody's, I think, right on it. What did it say? It said, holy to the Lord. Holy to the Lord, okay? So you have to get this, okay? Based upon the inscription, when the high priest showed up, like, dude got people's attention, okay? He's outside like his, his uniform is, is glistening in the sun, okay? As he's walking, you hear the sound of the bells, and so you can, you can hear him, and you can, you can hear his activity. There is something happening here when you saw the, the high priest, okay? Now, what about his job description? What did he do? Let's start with this. Once a year, and some of you just say, like, time out. Like, I wish I had a job where I just had to work one day a year. Like, wouldn't that be amazing? One day a year on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, it was his duty to pass from the side of people into the Holy of Holies, taking the atoning blood of a sacrificial animal. Okay? Now, the first thing that he had to do was deal with his own heart. Remember, he's a high priest, but he's also a sinner. So the first thing that he has to do is he has to make atonement for his own sins. And listen, history tells us that if the priest failed to first make proper atonement for his own sins, there was serious consequences. Like history tells us this, there were priests that went into the Holy of Holies. Once again, only the high priest was allowed in there who had not made proper atonement for themselves. And what did God do? Killed them on the spot. So now we got a big problem, right? Like only the high priests are allowed in there, and we've got a dead high priest in the Holy of Holies. What do we do? And what was their solution? Some of you know this. They started tying a rope around the priest, a high priest's ankle. So when he went into the Holy of Holies, they could listen if they, if they heard the bell stop moving and they heard a big thump, like dude's dead and they would just grab the rope and drag out his dead body. Serious stuff. He first has to make atonement for his own sins. Next is to make atonement for the sins of the children of God. So once he was inside the Holy of Holies, he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and then seven times in front of the mercy seat. And he was only allowed to stay in the Holy of Holies as long as it took to do that. That was it, okay? Now, let's just stop right there. I can already see your eyes glazing over, okay? You're like, can we get to the lab? Class time starting to like too much information. I'm drinking from the fire hose this morning, okay? Let's just stop right there, okay? We, we, we have barely scratched the surface on the symbolism and the duties and the roles of a high priest. Barely scratched the surface. But for today, I just want to leave it there, and I want to move into the lab, and I'm going to ask you, grow. 
learn more about this stuff because it really is important, okay? Now, according to the text, as we go through Hebrews, there's a test that the author of Hebrews is making, and he wants us to see this test. And the key question to this test is this. How does Jesus, how does Jesus compare to the high priest? So let's take some time now comparing Jesus to the high priest. Let's look at some of the symbols of Jesus and the high priest and compare the two, okay? First, the high priest, he had to annually go through this process of making atonement for sins, okay? So annually, listen, I, I haven't even scratched the surface. Annually, there was so much work to do in preparation, whether it's travel or getting animals together, or there's like we'd even talk about purification and water and, 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 and like getting dressed and getting your heart right, that there was so much preparation that went into this. And so at the end of the day, like after the day of atonement, it doesn't matter how well that day went, next year's coming, right? Now compare that to Jesus and his work on the cross. On the cross, Jesus died one time as an acceptable, completed, atoning work for sins. Romans 6.9 says this, For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. What's that saying? That's saying, listen, this is not a picture of Jesus. It's not like Jesus, after his death, burial, and then the day of resurrection, coming out of the tomb and saying, Whew, that sucked. That was so hard. That was a nightmare. Man, I'm really not looking forward to doing that again in a year. That's not a picture of Jesus at all in that. No, once and for all, the atonement, perfect work of Jesus on the cross was made for our sins, right? Next, I want you to look at the path of atonement. Where did the path of atonement lead the high priest to? Well, it led him into the Holy of Holies, this inner chamber in the temple, a holy sacred place that only he was allowed to go into, okay? Now, where did the path of atonement lead Jesus to? Well, that's answered in verse 14. It says this, this, since then we have a great high priest speaking specifically of Jesus, right? Who has passed through The heavens, the heavens. Let me ask you a question. Which is more, quote, unquote, holy? A temple here on earth, right? Or a temple in the heavens, the very throne room of God, where where, where God is seen and known and experienced face to face. I would submit to you that this is the ultimate holy of holies. This is the holiest of holies, By the way, what about the atoning blood? Whose blood did the high priest carry into the temple? He carried the blood of a sacrificed animal. Yet what do we see as an acceptable offering of Jesus on the cross? We see that it was, listen, God, may we get a vision of this, the brutality of the cross. That we would have a proper attitude. What do we see on the cross? We see it's Jesus' own personal blood drained from his body, poured out, that Jesus is the unblemished lamb whose blood's poured out. It's applied to our sin. It covers our sins, counted as righteous, counted as holy and acceptable in God's eyes, and our sins are washed away. By the way, what was the the first responsibility of the high priest? The high priest had to take responsibility for his own sinfulness and make atonement for his sins. Well, go to Jesus, okay? What about Jesus' quote-unquote sins? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So listen, this is not a picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane following the the path of of, of the earthly high priest who had to deal with their own sins first. It's not a picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, okay, uh, uh, Father, I just need to come to you and I need to get right with you. I need to confess all my sins to you before I go ahead with this. No, he was sinless. 
Yet on the cross, he bore the sins of the world. In essence, what was, what was Jesus doing on the cross? He was becoming sin on the cross on our behalf. And by the way, there's a beautiful promise in this. Put the pieces together. Man, I hope we get this. If Jesus is becoming sin on the cross, and cross is, the cross is an instrument of death, right? Crucifixion, death, and sins on the cross. What's happening? Sin is being crucified. Right now, you need to get this. Sin's living on death row. Okay? Literally, sin is living on death row right now. Its days are numbered. There will be a day where sin is finally eradicated by Jesus, right? No more for us to struggle with. No more lure. No more temptation. Permanently, finally removed from us. That inward bent that we call original sin that bends me away from God. That root will be removed from us. Like sins, sins days are numbered. That's like burst some hope. Like I'm leaning in, I'm pressing in. Like I want me some of that. Like I get so ticked off at my sin. I get so angry at it. Like God, how long? Like how could I take the bait again? I'm looking for a day where I'm like, no more wrestle, no more contention, no more struggle. By the way, how long was the high priest allowed to stay in the Holy of Holies? Listen, only long enough to get the job done. This sacred place to commune with God, only, only long enough to come in, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, sprinkle blood in front of the mercy seat, go. That's all. In and out. Do you ever see a picture of Jesus now as he's entered into the throne room of God, the holiest of holies, where God's saying, man, good job down there, like nailed it. Okay, now off you go. We don't see that at all. What's Jesus doing? He's seated right now at the right hand of the Father in his proper position of authority and power, his eternal position in the holiest of holies forever. In fact, let me take a minute and build that one out a little bit, okay? The high priest, in his journey, he passed through three doors. There was the outer courts. There was into this other room, this inner chamber inside, inside the temple, which was called the holy place. Passed through that door. Then he passed through the curtain into the holy of holies. And I'd submit to you that when Jesus ascended into the holiest of holies, into heaven, there was three passages that he went through. I would suggest he went through the atmosphere, the outer space, and into the palatial palace of God into God's throne room. And what did Jesus do when he arrived? Sat down. Do you see the high priest sitting down, just hanging out in the Holy of Holies? Now that right and that privilege wasn't afforded him. Right? Listen, as we're entering into the author's test, I think we're beginning to see like there, there is really no comparison between Jesus the great high priest, and human man, earthly, carnal high priest. There's just simply no comparison. And what the author's saying is, listen, this is your high priest. It's Jesus. When the storms of life hit, he is your anchor. He will hold you. Hold on to this confession of who Jesus is. Jesus not only meets the qualifications of a high priest, but you've got to get this this morning. He exceeds them. Let's go back to those qualifications. What were the three qualifications of a high priest? Uh, there was solidarity. Uh, there was sympathy. And then lastly, there was selection. How do we see that in Jesus? Well, solidarity. What did Jesus do? He took on flesh and became human, okay? And this is why the incarnation of Jesus is so big, at the same time, let's just tell the truth, it's really confusing, okay? So what do we know about Jesus? It's the hypostatic union, theologically we call it that. Fully God, fully man, forever. What's that look like? When you figure that out, let me know, okay? Like, I don't get it, but he's fully God, fully man, forever. And, and, and it's so much humility and so much beauty in the incarnation of Christ. What do we see in Jesus' journey to earth? What did we see for the journey? It's not like he's overpacking his bags for the journey. He's unpacking his bags. He's taking his glory and he's setting his glorious side. In humility, he's being born as a baby, fully human, a, a human mind, human flesh, like, he, 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 he has to walk through this process of being ignorant as a baby and talk. 
or, and, 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 and learn. Like he has to learn how to talk as a baby before he can learn to talk as a man. He has to learn how to walk like a baby before he can walk like a man. So much humility. And what about sympathy? He gets it. In his humanity, Jesus knows our struggles as humans. I would describe our connection to Jesus in scientific terms this morning. This is some fun exercise for you to go and study. In scientific terms, there's something called sympathetic resonance. I'd planned this morning to have a prop and do this for you, but my my, my week ran short, and I didn't have a chance to go do this for you. Sympathetic resonance. Anybody ever heard of sympathetic resonance in scientific terms before? Yeah. So here's what, how sympathetic resonance works. In, in, in essence, what I could do is I could have two grand pianos up here sitting side by side. Now, no, I wasn't going to bring in two grand pianos, but that would have been pretty <laughs> awesome. I can have two of them sitting side by side, and if they're tuned perfectly, I can go over to this grand piano, and I can play a B flat. And I can come over to this one, I could, I could play a B flat, and you know what happened? This one over here would start playing a B flat. Start playing a B flat. You could go, bong, and then if you could mute it all, and I know there's extra uh, reverberation through the soundboard, and all, if you mute it all, suddenly there'd be no sound here, but a B flat's coming up in this piano. It's beautiful, and this is what I was going to do. It, this is so easy to do. Take two tuning forks. Take one tuning fork, bong, and just put the other one up next to it. Mute this one with your hand, and what do you hear? Sympathetic resonance. And that's who we have with Jesus. We are connected. There's a wavelength between our heart and the heart of Jesus that when you struggle and that when you're frustrated and when you see the brokenness of life and you heard Jesus says, I know, I hear that, I feel that, I experience that. You're beginning to see what a beautiful high priest we have who sympathizes us with us in our weakness. He was tempted in all ways, but yet didn't sin. And I know there's people out there who's like, yeah, well, he's a son of God. Easy for him to do. I love what C.S. Lewis has to say on this. C.S. Lewis says this, and this is a little, little deep, so stay with me, okay? Because I think, I think the point is pretty strong. C.S. Lewis, popular author and theologian. A silly idea is, the, is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of a wind by walking against it, not by laying down. A man who gives into temptation after five minutes simply doesn't know what it would have been like after an hour. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have just lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of an evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation truly means. The only complete realist. Wow. Powerful. What about selection? Last qualification. The text addressed that today. Verse 5 in chapter 5 says, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son today. I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Listen, we've got a priest interceding on our behalf forever. Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus not only was the chosen high priest by God, but he has two different roles. Forever what he is a king, both Lord and Christ, and forever he holds this priestly office interceding for you and I. This author gives us this eternal truth, eternal king, eternal priest. This wasn't something, listen, that we, we, we look at Jesus and we, we, we never see a glimpse of Jesus saying, well, listen, I'm entitled to that. We never see this, this isn't something Jesus lobbied for or demanded. 
Jesus' only motivation in life was to do this. It was to see the Father glorified, and the Father was glorified through his life. And it's a blessing and honoring Jesus' faithfulness. We see the Father exalting the Son, eternal King, eternal High Priest. So what? How do we apply this to our life? I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. Really simple. A few things I think that we need to ponder and maybe apply to our lives this week. Who's your anchor? When storms hit? Like you busy just going around trying to fix things on your own? What you holding on to? You holding on to your own skills? Your own intellect? To try and fix things? To try and hold you upright in the midst of storms of life? To protect you from, from the sheer winds? From the hail of life? What is your anchor? Today we're reminded that we have an anchor in our life that can sympathize with your pain. Like, what are you feeling in your heart? Like, to, to, to know Jesus is to, is, to, is, is to come to him and say, Jesus, here's where I'm at, and here's the cool thing. He longs for you to do that. He requires you to do that, but he already feels it as your, as, as, as your bigger brother, Right? He feels it, and, and being connected in his sympathy, been there, done that, I know that. You, can, you got somebody that sympathizes with you in your pain. You are not alone. You are not alone in life storms. Back later, we can talk about Jesus and his ability to calm life storms. Sometimes he does that. Or sometimes to simply teach us something by walking with us through life storms. And the last thing I want you to get is this, as a follower of Jesus, one of the things that we want to do is we want to emulate Jesus. And we want to become more like Jesus. I'm going to read a verse to you, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race. You are a what? Royal priesthood. You are called to be a priest too. You are, you, you are called to, be, to, to, to serve your brothers and sisters. To make God's name known. Make great, to make mediation. Part of our mediation is to pray for the lost. Some of our mediation is to call out sin. And to call people up. Listen, God lo looks at you and he knows your strengths and he knows your weaknesses and he's calling you into a work to do as a priest. So what work is he going to call you to this week? Be available and be open for his glory. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, that, that Jesus is the great high priest that we are connected to who sympathizes with us. Comfort us. Hold us tight. Hold us strong like you do in the midst of life storms. Commission us, God, to be salt, to be light, to be your priest. And bring an attention to the work of Jesus, the great high priest, and what he's done on the cross, we pray. So lead us through that. We just pray this week, today, we just be faithful in that. All for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond now. This, this time here, we respond again in, in a diversity of ways. We respond to the Word of God being taught through, maybe sometimes it's just sitting and just pondering and meditating <laughs> on, on that. Sometimes it's journaling. It's sometimes like it's, it's, it's prayerful. We also have a context for expressing worship and adoration to God through song. We'll take some time now also to remember Jesus the way that he said he wanted to be remembered uh, through communion. 
And so as we go through these next songs, at any time you're free to come and, and, and grab the crackers and the juice represented Jesus' body and his blood. And we take it in remembrance of the brutality of the cross, the blood that was poured out, the atonement that was made for us, as well as the great hope that we have. And we also worship God by saying, God, listen, my wallet, my checkbook, that is not my functional savior. You are. And so we worship God financially by giving. And so this is a time where you can do that, whether it's in the offering boxes here. You can go online and do that as well as an, as an, as an attitude of worship to God. So I'm going to pray. The band's going to lead us, and then you can respond. God, thank you for your goodness. Now, God, in this time of response, I pray you break routine. <laughs> you break traditions. Even though we may do some of the same things that we typically do, that it wouldn't just be a routine and it wouldn't be a tradition, but it truly would be a, res a worshipful response to who you are, what you've done, where you're taking us, and your incredible grace and mercy. So lead us through a heart response now. In Jesus' name, amen. You're free to respond.